Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org. Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Jean Till, and on today's show, we're visiting with Father Jim Kirby, pastor of St. Anne in Logan and St. Patrick in Missouri Valley, and his recent trip to Ukraine. And that's uh, one of several trips he's taken. Oh, my goodness. He's a great uh, witness and Mm -hmm. solidarity with the Ukrainian people. But uh, good to be with you, Jean, on this first weekend of Lent. Uh, We'll go out into the desert. Uh, Maybe it's a snow-laden desert, but uh, (laughs) that that we can do that. Uh, Always an opportunity for those who've been pursuing that path to the Easter sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. So today we're going to be celebrating the rite of election at St. Patrick's and Council Bluffs. Okay. And we're going to come back uh, to Central Iowa tomorrow at St. Francis of Assisi. So those are all uh, beautiful events mm-hmm. and the kind of the infectious desire and anticipation of these people and those who've accompanied them. It's a, a beautiful moment of, of life for our diocesan church in a, in a powerful way. Also be with the permanent deacons this afternoon and a St. John Adele, they gather together Together, and uh, that community continues to, to flourish and be such a vital part of our ministerial uh, repertoire, if we will. That's so mm-hmm. uh, powerful in that own respect also. So uh, good things happening as we move into the season. And obviously Bishop Hannafelt last week kind of gave us a, a disposition to let the Lord maybe inform, inspire us what we're to be about during these sacred days as well. You know, we have a tendency to tell him what we want to do and what we want him to do as opposed to really learning to listen. And that's a challenge. Yeah. We pipe him a tune and he doesn't dance. I I don't don't know. I don't get that. (laughs) (laughs) So, but the, uh, the, the tune of the the laments, the cries, the anguish of the Ukrainian people. And in preparation for our conversation with uh, Father Jim Kirby, uh, thinking also of the message that the uh, Archbishop, he's also kind of the patriarch of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, uh, Svatoslav Shev, uh, in his message, and he's been, a, I think, a signal figure, a uh, heroic witness. He, along with his brother bishops and priests of that country, uh, they wrote a message uh, to our own U.S. bishops this past uh, September. It came to us actually in December as well, as they'd gathered together. That sense of a whole, the human suffering and material devastation, numbing to the point that no one can longer process them mentally or emotionally, for nothing is sacred for the Russian invaders. Hospitals, schools, parks, churches, apartments blocks and private residences, marketplaces, restaurants, energy grids, grids, transportation and food supply routes. And yet the spirit of Ukrainian's people remains unbroken, says the archbishop, and volunteers remains high among the general population. That's not to say, though, that there hasn't been anguish and woundedness, mm-hmm. not only on the uh, physical level, the life of mortality, but the spiritual level. It's necessary to understand that what happens to us does not define who we are. We think of the soldiers who returned from the battlefield with physical and psychological scars. We think of those who buried family members or have lost contact with their loved ones, not knowing if they've been taken captive or died on the front lines. So many of our parishes have understood their calling to provide safe places where the wounded can rediscover their humanity in prayer and Christian fellowship. And yet this woundedness opens up the wounds that extend back for generations for mm-hmm. the Ukrainian people, maybe not just for generations, but for centuries. And that profound spiritual and psychological trauma. We understand that each experience of trauma is unique. The violence of war challenges us to keep the evil and hatred visited upon us from infecting us spiritually and dominating our lives. And so that one doesn't allow one's heart to be hardened by this and allow the evil to claim us, that we become evil in the process. And reminds us something that maybe gets lost sight of uh, as the archbishop and his brother Ukrainian bishops asked the Holy Father to lead a church reflection. Ukraine's self-sacrificing act in 1994 to unilaterally give up its nuclear arsenal Their hope that the 30th anniversary of this prophetic act of disarmament in this year 2024 can be an occasion for study and remembrance by the international community, but especially in the Catholic Church. Ways to foster communication between the apostolic see and the local churches. So this sensitivity that to call to be peacemakers Mm -hmm. and this renunciation, it's not just amassing the more powerful weapons, but how is that something that's ingrained in the DNA of the Ukrainian people? Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll learn more about Ukraine and what's been happening on the ground with Father Jim Kirby, who is the pastor of St. Anne in Logan and St. Patrick in Missouri Valley, in Missouri Valley. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. 
Mercy One is proud to support Iowa Catholic Radio. Mercy One helps you live your best life. Find personalized care for you and your loved ones at mercyone.org. Iowa Catholic Radio would like to thank our business partner, Edible Arrangements, for their support, offering fruit bouquets and gourmet dip chocolate treats. On the go or have it delivered for that special occasion, ediblearrangements.com. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. And on today's show, we're visiting with Father Jim Kirby, pastor of St. Anne in Logan and St. Patrick in Missouri Valley, and his recent trip to the Ukraine. And a recent trip, but uh, one of several trips you've taken, mm-hmm. Father Kirby. Thank you for your ministry and shepherding the people of Logan and Missouri mm-hmm. Valley and taking that on. But uh, your your heart and your worldview encompasses the Ukrainian people. When we think about all the regions, and you know, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, said when you think about all the regions of conflict, it's almost tantamount to World War Three already happening. Right. But your heart and passion are with the Ukrainian people. Why? What sparked that for you? I've been to Ukraine uh, probably four or five times before the war started. I know people there. I have some friends there. And so, you know, when the war started almost two years ago now, to to hear them in real time, uh, their fear at the, you know, when the fir- when the war first started, uh, a couple of them live in Bucha and uh, outside of uh, Kiev. And so, you know, having an emotional attachment to those people and just the outright evil of this thing, you know, captured my attention and you want to help your people, your friends. And so that's what got me uh, dedicated to it. So it really was a personal mm. matter for oh, you. Yeah, very, very definitely. And were they sending you personal reports and social media and other ways, giving yeah, you their yeah. own lens on this? Yeah, we were communicating through uh, Messenger and Facebook. And, uh, you know, to hear them, well, we're in the bomb shelter again. And then you don't hear from them for a while because mm. the Internet's down, electricity's out. You know, it's, But uh, you don't know what it is. Right. I don't know what it is. I don't know if they're alive or not. Mm-hmm. You know? But uh, they, all, they all are. And, you know, the good thing about the, the Ukrainian people is they immediately help. They go to work whatever way they can. And so they're always uh, working for their country. And so that's what my friends are doing. Okay, so not just a, you know, obviously a lot had to retreat into shelters, uh, subway stations, underground. uh, Right, yeah. Yeah, uh, They were used to it. I mean, how do you get used to it? But, uh, you know, they take their business down the subway when there's an air raid. Uh, That's where the schools are in the subway. Uh, Kharkiv is making a, a huge underground school. So Kharkiv is close to the border. And uh, with Russia. Yeah. yeah. And so whatever they uh, hear a siren, an air raid, they always thank God because the missiles usually arrive before uh, the air raid. That's how close they are. Mm. And so they can barely get any warning for any of that. So do they live each day as, oh, hey, this Lord, this may be my last day, but uh, right. what would I do differently? Right. Uh, a friend of mine says, uh, well, I woke up. I have my war coffee. That's what she calls it. And I'm ready to live my life again. Mm. That's kind of their attitude, you know. Oh, so oh. so in your various trips, have you been to different regions or primarily uh, in the east or? Uh, mostly to the east. Yeah. Like uh, uh, Kharkiv, I mentioned I've been there several times. And also uh, some of the border towns uh, with uh, Russia. We went to a little town called Stari Saltiv, which was uh, occupied by the Russians. And then the Ukrainians pushed them out. But, uh, you know, they blew up the bridge to keep the Russians out. But at the same time, you separate families and humanitarian aid and all those things. And so you could hear the war. You know, it's not too far away. So, yeah, we went there. Uh, went Like I said, uh, went to Bucha in Irpin and just saw, you know, the atrocities that took place there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you have friends or family here in Iowa or at home saying, what are you doing? Do you have a death wish or something? Yeah. Right. Why? Why <laughs> right. would you do right. this? Yeah, a lot of people were wondering what I was doing, but I think now they kind of understand it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. That love and affection you have for those people to mm-hmm. be on the ground. Um, you know, as a priest, obviously a gifted preacher, people love your homilies and everything else, but you bring also your, your life experience as a photojournalist to bear, uh, how does that shape your involvement and and the the way in which you communicate what you're witnessing? Well, uh, the first, you know, I was asking myself, how can I help? And so, one of the first things I saw was they uh, were uh, 
calling for photographers. And the first thing they were worried about is being able to document the war crimes. And so that's what they were looking for photographers for. But uh, by the time I uh, was ready to go in June, that had all shifted. And so um, I started looking for organizations. June 2022. Right? That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, a couple of organizations were asking for photographers. And so uh, I got connected with the Rotary Club in uh, – uh, Kiev, mm-hmm. and through them, uh, it's, it was great because we were able to travel around in the northeast part of uh, uh, Ukraine, where that's where the Russians came from. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, would one land in Poland and make your way by train, or would you go directly uh, into? Uh, yeah, you fly into Warsaw, and then you have a choice of the the bus or the train, and so either one of them are probably fourteen hour trips. Mm. So, yeah. But it's not bad. You meet your you meet your friends, and uh, the ladies like to mother me. You know, when, when they realize I don't speak Ukrainian, and <laughs> so that 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 could be a barrier. Except, yeah, you transcend that. Yeah. But you know, I've never ever been in a place where there's not one person that speaks English. Mm-hmm. You know, and if, even if they don't, uh, you know, I have my translator thing on my phone. And so we're able to communicate one way or the other. So Okay. All right. And would younger people with the Internet and everything be, have usually some English under their belt? Uh, you know, they, they take it in school. I don't know if it's – I don't think it's required. But I, I talk to the, some of the kids, and they say they take it in school. You know, and some of them are very good at it, and some of them – aren't as good, but yeah. they try. Or just listening to music and things. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. the TV and everything like that, you know, they yeah. pick it up. So you you enter into a, a village, a city, uh, your camera is with you. Uh, are people receptive? Or like, who is this guy? What What is he about? And, well, I'm, and do, uh, do they come to know you're a priest eventually? Uh, well, I'm very sensitive to people, especially in that situation. Like we went to this uh, town, Starry Saltive, and we went to one of the humanitarian aid centers and I wanted to make sure they were okay with me taking pictures of the people there. And and they were, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, to be honest, uh, uh, my identity as a priest doesn't often come up because it's, you know, in the, in the thick of it, when you're trying to, uh, (laughs) it just doesn't come up, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's not your mission at that no, point, right? No. You know, even though you're bringing your own faith and right, spirituality right. to bear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There's a big uh, Catholic presence in Western Ukraine uh, from the influence from Poland. And there's a, a cathedral. There's two churches, Catholic churches in Kiev. One of them is St. Nicholas. That's the cathedral. So I've been there several times. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. The only city I've been privileged to visit seven years ago was Lviv, you know, and, uh, to be there in Lviv, uh, however mm-hmm. they say it. But, uh, yeah, and St. Peter and Paul Church, which they're bringing back victims from the Eastern Front. That's where they often they'll have six or seven military funerals a day at that right. church, you know, mm-hmm. and so in that way. Uh, are, what's the sensitivity as a photojournalist? To atrocities, perhaps to bodies that have been maimed in the in the missile attacks or other things, what what kind of guides you in that? You have to take pictures because people won't. You know, obviously you're, you're thinking, "Oh my God, I don't want to take a picture of that," but you got to force yourself to do it because uh, that's what you're doing. You're documenting it. I remember we were in a uh, little town in the uh, I'm going to mispronounce this the Cherkisky region. Uh, there was this. Uh, bombed out Russian transport, and so I was taking pictures of it, and I'm like, what's that smell? And I realized what it was right away. You know, several soldiers had burned up in that oh, transport. Oh, the carnage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but, uh, and then so do you forward those pictures to an inter- international news service uh, or a rotary? Well, or A couple of different things. Uh, the Rotary Club uses them a lot. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the first year I went, I took a lot of pictures. I take less and less as I uh, keep going back. But they use those. Uh, they, there was a, a photo display that they used in different countries, uh, you know, to promote the Rotary Club and the war, you know, help for the war, things like that. So, you know, and uh, the need for photos isn't as great as it once was. Everybody's kind of settled down and everybody's got a cell phone, you know, mm-hmm. everybody <laughs> thinks they're a photographer. So, mm-hmm. anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're, you know, you talked about your friends and the human connections that you have. 
Uh, and I'm just thinking about the bitter cold there. You were there after. Yeah. I mean, we think we have it bad. You know, we had some 30 degree mm-hmm. below weather conditions here as well. But but I, I quoted Archbishop Shevkuk in the initial segment. But how in the tenacity of the people, how is their faith there? Is it taking a toll, do you think, on their national spirit? Uh, are people moving into depression or well, they all despair got and PTSD. alcoholism or whatever? Mm. Yeah. Well, you don't see as much alcoholism. I haven't seen it anyway. But I notice that, you know, the dark under the eyes, um, you know, there's always a, a tension, you know, because, and you can't really sleep well at night because you never know when the sirens are going on. And a lot of times people just sleep through the sirens and they're, uh, they get uh, uh, awakened by the uh, air defense shooting something down. And <laughs> that is loud. I mean, it's just the windows shake and you're thinking that the thing is going to break any minute, you know, and so... <laughs> I was uh, in Kharkiv, and there was a, an attack, and so I was going to the bomb shelter, and I go, go down to the lobby, and there's people just kind of sitting around, and I, I said, where's the bomb shelter? And they were like, why don't you go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is you sleep with two walls between you and the windows, so that's what they do. They don't necessarily go to bomb shelters as much. In the city, they do, <laughs> but so uh, that's usually what people do if they don't go to the subway. Uh, mm-hmm. or, uh, Who wants to be thinking about, oh, how many walls are there between me and the window? Right. I mean, that's just, it's unfathomable for us. Right. And they're used to it now. You know, they have their little places that they go in the hallway or, you know, whatever they mm-hmm. need to do. So, And children, this is the new normal for children? or right. I mean, they, Oh, you know, there's some heartbreaking videos of little babies when they hear that siren. You know, they all just cry and pets and... You know, mm-hmm. it's just horrible, that awful, awful sound, you know. Mm-hmm. So we were doing, uh, we were working on camel blankets uh, for the military. And so it's an intricate thing. You have to uh, basically knit them together. And so I was volunteering for that. And the air raid went off. And so everybody's got to shut down. you got to go to the subway. Uh, the restaurants don't serve. The subway doesn't run. You can't go across a bridge. Uh, so, you know, you're stuck. And so go to the bomb shelter for a while, okay. sometimes an hour, sometimes several hours, sometimes four or five times a day. Right. You know? Right. So, kind of so the Russians are good at uh, doing it like during rush hour. Mm-hmm. You know, that's when most people or at night when they come home from work. So it's, it's calculated, a kind oh, of psychological absolutely. terrorism. Yeah, they don't. Uh, they're not bombing military uh, targets. They're targeting schools and apartments and things like that. Mm-hmm. 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 Which, perhaps, unlike Hamas and Gaza and other things, those aren't places that the Ukrainian people are se- sequestering military forces. No, or anything not at like all. That. Well, the Russians will say they are, you know, obviously, uh-huh. but they're not. Yeah. yeah. So like, we do take more than a grain of salt with what the right. Russian uh, propaganda right. machine is about right. as well. Um, you know, this fierce independent spirit we talked about, you know, for for going in the, in the court of nuclear weapons and how that made them vulnerable. But yet this tenacity, uh, they, they, they're willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, sometimes people have to kind of be called to that. Uh, adult males were prohibited from leaving the country to be conscripted into military service. Mm-hmm. What's the general attitude toward that mandate? And, and how does this impact of the, the regard for President Zelensky? Well, that's generally true for most countries when they go to war. You know, they keep their males, and that's just part of it. You know, that's what Russia does, and, you know. And so, you know, they're fine with it. There's two different military groups that fight for Ukraine. One of them is the official uh, military of the government. And so they get a lot of the supplies. And then there's the volunteer part. And they don't get as much of the supplies that the other group gets. And so that's who I usually help is bring tourniquets and field bandages and uh, chemical hand warmers, things like that. So uh, people don't have a problem at all. You never hear anybody complaining. You never hear any, like, protests or anything like that. They do protest when they think the government is wasting their money on some facade of a building or something like that, and they might protest that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's Mm -hmm. really... 
absolutely striking. We talk about, and it's a, certainly a contested issue here in the United States, and political candidates running for office are, are you know, weighing in on alternative sides. Is, have we spent enough? Have, you know, is our, our spirit, and you know, is it time to walk away from Ukraine like we have from other conflicts? Uh, but uh, the vast billions of dollars that have been invested, not only from the United States, but NATO countries. But tell me about that dynamic and how that flows. Um, in 1994, the United States convinced Ukraine to give up their nuclear weapons and a lot of their other weapons with the promise that we would protect them and take care of them. And now it appears that we are just kidding. And so the other thing about the money, it's the money that the United States has sent represents about 5% of the military budget and about 2% of, of the U.S. military budget, mm-hmm. 2% of the GDP. And so a lot of people don't realize that they're just... We're not just sending cash. We're we're paying for the uh, equipment and the weapons that are sent to Ukraine. And then the money that we promise Ukraine goes to the companies here in the United States that replenish what they give to Ukraine. So we have all this stuff that we never use and will never use. Just sitting there. So we're not giving the best equipment to help no, fight. Not at their, all. Yeah. You know, they talk about the Abrams tank. Those, they don't, we would never use those now. Things like that. Hmm. I mean, even the F-16s are out, outdated pretty much. Hmm. So. Interesting. So we'll give them to Ukraine, sell them to Turkey and whatever we're going to do there. Yeah. So, right. uh, Father, we're going to ask you to pause for a little okay. bit and then we'll come back. Okay. Stay with us as we continue our conversation with Father Jim Kirby, pastor of St. Anne in Logan and St. Patrick in Missouri Valley, and his recent trip and experiences in Ukraine. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio provided by Knights of Columbus Borman and Pfeiffer Agency, serving the Catholic families in Iowa. The Knights of Columbus is a fraternal benefit society providing financial security to members and their families, specializing in life insurance, long-term care insurance, disability income insurance, and retirement annuities. You can reach Knights of Columbus Field Agent Gregory Waddle at 563-689-6801. That's 563-689-6801. Thank you and God bless. Support for programming is provided by Construction Professionals, serving customers through a proven process creating unique design, functionality, and artistic beauty. Construction Professionals is a Catholic family business built on a strong foundation. cpcustomhomes.com Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. Well, thank you. And uh, Father Kirby, last month we concluded the week of Christian unity. We think about that. But uh, this... this, uh, Divide between East and West, which historically, you know, back to 1054 and the Orthodox Church and everything else, uh, that's fomenting some of this, right? Mm-hmm. It's an underlying subtext that uh, perhaps is there, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in union with the, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope and things. Uh, you're, you're looking a little circumspect, so maybe you want well, to refine uh, that question. I don't think, I don't see a, a, a tension between the Roman Church and the Orthodox Church. What I see a tension is the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Uh, Russian Orthodox Church has been proven that there's spies among their clergy. Uh, that's part of the communication that Russia has. And so everybody hears that uh, the Russian Orthodox Church has been kicked out. Oh, my gosh, they're suppressing Christianity. It is the farthest thing from the truth. They're kicking out the spies uh, yeah. that are infiltrating the Orthodox Church of the Russians. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, Patriarch Kirill and his uh, role in this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was mentioning earlier, you just can't believe some of the things that he says. Uh, he told soldiers uh, every time you kill a Ukraine, Ukrainian soldier, you go right to heaven. You know, things like that is just unbelievable. Wow, mm-hmm. the perversion of religion. You know, right. So, in mm-hmm. that way. So, so, actually, the relationships between the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church okay. are, are flowing all right? Uh, yeah, I, I don't sense that. You know, I haven't really looked into it, but I, never, I see uh, the Catholic Church there. Uh, seems like everything's pretty peaceful. Uh, Mm-hmm. I don't sense any tension at all. Okay. Yeah. Ukrainian Greek Catholic, Ukrainian Catholic University mm-hmm. is, is flourishing in any way. So versus our ch- patriarch Kirill, Jesus calling us ultimately to be peacemakers. Mm-hmm. You, know, you kind of referred to the, the buildup of the military industrial complex. You know, mm-hmm. there are profiteers here. What would you see? Could you speculate? Could there be? Do we hope? What's our hope for resolution? The only way to stop this is defeat the Russian military. 
Uh, everybody says, well, let's just stop and, you know, let's negotiate with Russia. Russia has violated every treaty, every promise. And let's face it, they've been invading Ukraine since 2014, since they invaded Crimea. And they sense, well, nobody's doing anything about it. So they keep going. And they're not going to stop with Ukraine. There's already overtures, you know, to the Baltic states, uh, Poland. And so uh, it will be very expensive if we abandon Ukraine now. Mm-hmm. You know? And it won't save lives. It'll make it worse. You know, and they want to give up uh, the eastern part and the southern part of Ukraine as part of the, uh, you know, let's make a peace deal. Well, what about those people that live in those areas? I mean, let's face it. Russians are cruel. They have very little regard for human life. Mm. So, okay. I mean, I hear people say that. I'm like, <laughs> and, and we don't want to paint a, a brush over all you Russian people, but those who are at the, you know, there is that kind of ethic. And, you well, know, the as, military the, as they acquiesce to their dictator, basically, Vladimir Putin. But, uh, you know. And, you know, I mean, the information that he's given out is really, you know, guarded. And so they believe all kinds of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, of course, other nations, China, et cetera, are looking at what North Korea, follows, you know, Iran. Korea, right. Yeah. So so that's got Sweden and Finland's attention. Oh, yeah. That, and yeah. where we want to go with that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, your present assignment, and thank you for embracing the yoke as pastor there. But we've made a kind of an understanding that we're still kind of trying to put it in place where mm-hmm. you could be away from the parish and that mm-hmm. the diocese would support that, that you would be made available to parishes to, to perhaps preside and preach at mass if pastors mm-hmm. give you that invitation. Uh, I've talked to the bishops of Region 9, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, to alert that, you know, this is something that you can mm-hmm. give uh, to talk about them. Maybe your, your photojournalist exhibit, which was at sure. one time in the pastoral center. Um, what would that look like and what would be your message as you go forward? Uh, my message would be, um, I think, in my opinion, we're obligated to take care of the least of God's kingdom. And if you can't, if we can't see that in the people of Ukraine, we're really missing it. And it's not to say that there's not all of that conflict that's going on all throughout the world. But, uh, you know, when you look at these different conflicts, that's what we're on to do. Mm-hmm. That's what we're on to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for your passion and your prophetic witness. And again, I want to support you and collaborate with you. So mm-hmm. if there are parishes listening uh, on Iowa Catholic Radio, Spirit Catholic Radio Network, uh, Father Jim Kirby, uh, you know, I think by reaching out to the parish website, how to get a hold of him. And Father Kirby, you have a word for the people who have already uh, supported That's right. You. I want to thank the people of St. Anne's and Logan in Missouri Valley, St. Patrick's, also the Emmaus House. People have been very generous. And one last thing is like call your congressman and your senator. Please, please, please support Ukraine. Thank you, Father Kirby. This has been another edition of Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. Thank you to our guest and to all of our listeners in Nebraska, Iowa, Wisconsin, or wherever you may be listening to Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org.